<clears throat> After uh, a few days more of living in uh, Mauni Baba's cave, Babaji decided that we will go towards Uttarkashi, spend some time in Uttarkashi and go to Gangotri where the Ganga actually descends into the plains and from there go on to Gomuk and beyond that to Tapovan, it's a, a complete glacier called the Tapovan Gangotri Glacier. So plans were made, with Babaji plans were made means one day he would get up and say tomorrow morning we are going, this is how plans are made. So I was very happy because I was always looking forward to going to the source of the Ganga which is called Go Mukha. Now, it's very interesting and we must understand the importance of Gomuk. In the Bhagavata Purana, there is a beautiful uh, story. Now, you must know that the Ganga which, ascend, which descends from uh, Gomuk is also called Bhagirati. The Bhagirati which comes down from there and joins with Alaknanda and then becomes the Ganga. So the Bhagirati owes his uh, name to Bhagirat, who was a grandson of the great emperor Sagara, who is referred to in the Bhagavatam. The story is that uh, the great uh, emperor Sagara conducted uh, what you call uh, Ashwamedha where a horse is let loose to wander around and whoever can get hold of that horse is appointed the ruler of the country. Usually what happens is the, um, the ruler who lets go of the horse himself catches it or someone from their family brings it back. Now Sagara was already a very powerful emperor in Puranic times. He is supposed to have had a thousand sons. Can you imagine a thousand sons? This is not possible in this yuga. Kali yuga is difficult to look after one son. Anyway, so this is what the Bhagavad says. So, Indra is always the god Indra who is the god of the sense organs or king of all the gods, Devas, is always afraid that if a human being on earth becomes powerful, he might occupy heaven and take over from him. So fearing that the horse may go back to their kingdom, Indra is supposed to have stolen the horse and uh, hidden it somewhere. So Indra thought, even if I hide it in Devaloka, they will catch me. So where can I hide in a safe place where the horse is not discovered? So the story goes that below the earth or under the sea, there is a loka uh, where the great Muni Kapila, who is the founder of the Sankhya philosophy and about whom Krishna says in the Gita, that among the Munis, I am Kapila. That great Rishi is supposed to be doing tapasya in the nether world under the sea. So Indra decided it's better to take the horse to the nether world and tie it somewhere there so that nobody will find it. And he also thought if I tie it near Kapila Muni, people would think maybe Kapila stole it. So there is no problem for me, I can escape. And Kapila is supposed to be in deep meditation there in the nether world. So when King Sagara came to know that his horse was uh, stolen in the Ashwamedha. He didn't know that Indra has done this. He sent his thousand sons to go and uh, find out where it was. So the Bhagavat Purana says that when the thousand sons with their mighty warriors came and looked everywhere and went down to the netherworld, they found that the horse was tied near Kapilamuni was in deep meditation. Now, 
they thought as Indra thought would happen that Kapila has stolen the horse. So they made a big commotion and Kapila from meditation opened his eyes and they, and they accused him of stealing the horse. You know, Kapila being upset by this charge that he had stolen the horse in a little bit of anger, not even much, looked at the thousand sons of Sagara. The Bhagavad says that they were all reduced to ashes. Now, when this was reported to Sagara, he sent different people to find out where the ashes of his thousand sons, nobody could succeed. Finally, his grandson, Bhagirath, went looking for uh, ashes, went to the nether world and found Kapila Muni meditating deeply. So he prostrated before him and with due respect asked him if he knew anything about this. And Kapila Muni said, yes, this is what happened. Your uh, grandfathers, thousand grandfathers have all been reduced to ashes because of this. It was an inadvertent move on my part. I was a little upset, so I looked at them and they turned to ashes. This is what a great yogi is capable of. So Bhagirat said, that is all right, sir, but how do we bring it back? How do we get to get them back? And Kapila Muni said, there is only one possibility. In the heavens, which means in the upper regions, beyond the earth, flows a river called Ganga. You have to invite Ganga to come down to the earth. The moment the waters of the Ganga touch the ashes, all your thousand grandfathers will come back to life. So Bhagirat said, how do I do that? So Kapila Muni said, do intense tapasya and request Ganga to flow down from high up. So Bhagirat is supposed to have done intense tapasya near Tapovan. That's why it's called Tapovan. And then Ganga, in the form of a beautiful woman, appeared before him and said, Okay, I, I accept your tapasya. I have done ghor tapasya for so long. I am willing to come, but there are some problems. So you have to solve it for me. Bhagirat said, What? So Ganga said, One is that I am so strong that your earth will not be able to withstand my pressure. So when I hit the earth, probably I will punch a hole through the earth and come out on the other side. How do you get rid, how do you handle this problem? The other is that there are so many sinners on earth that when if I come, they will all have a bath. And when they have a bath, all my waters will get polluted. So there are two problems. If you solve them, I am willing to come. So as it happens in many of these uh, Puranas and Itihasas, Bhagirath went to Shiva and Kailash and said, these are the two problems that I am facing. Can you help me? Shiva said to him, in the Bhagavad, that second problem is easily sorted out. Please tell Ganga, not only are there sinners on this earth, there are also great sages in the Himalayas. And if one sage washes his body in the waters of the Ganga, the pollution of hundreds and thousands of sinners washing their bodies will be annihilated. It will get pure. And for the first, there is only one solution. Nobody else can do this. I am the only one who can withstand. I am the only one who prevented the poison which came out during Samudra Manthan from spreading into the world and killing everybody. So I can help you with this. I can receive the Ganga as it comes from heavens 
on my matted locks and then control and allow her to trickle down gently so that she does not poke a hole through the bhuloka. So, it was agreed. When this was put to, Bhag to the Ganga, she agreed. So, Bhagirath came in front and Ganga followed and therefore, she was called Bhagirathi because she came with the tapasya of Bhagirath. Now, the place where Ganga comes emerges from the glaciers is known as Gomuk because it is shaped like the mouth of a cow, Gomukha. You can actually go and see it, it is huge glacier which goes into Sampavan. From inside the glacier there is an arch and from there it comes out. And it looks like North Pole as you see in the pictures because everywhere there is ice, you see icebergs floating along with the water. And it truly seems to be endless, it keeps coming, it has been coming for thousands of years. Anyway, so our intention was to go to Uttarkashi first, spend a few days and then go beyond to Gangotri where the Ganga descends into the plains and then beyond to Gomuk and Tapo. So, the first halt was Uttarkashi. So, after many days, Babaji on the way showed me many things. We talked various things, discussed, we, we can't go completely into this. We reached Uttarkashi. Those days, Tarkashi was a very, very beautiful place. Now, also it is beautiful, but it has now because of the pilgrims and the roads having improved and hundreds of vehicles during the pilgrim season, it has become a little busy and a little dirty with plastic and this and that. Those days, it was pristine and pure and clear and most of the people who lived there were sadhus. It was a colony of sadhus living here and there in small kutis. Now, it is called Uttarkashi because the main temple around which this uh, Uttarkashi is built is a temple of uh, Shiva. It is a um, small linga, but an ancient linga worshipped by great rishis for hundreds and thousands of years. It is the central part of Uttarkashi. And because it is a Shiva, ancient Shiva temple, Kashi Vishwanath is the name given to Shiva. So, it is a Kashi Vishwanath temple and it is also called Uttar Kashi because it flows from, in, in Banaras, the river flows this way. Uh, in the rivers, normally you see rivers flowing from north to south, here it flows some distance from south to north. In the same way, in Uttar Kashi, the Ganga flows, the Bhagirathi flows in a reverse direction just like uh, Banaras. So, it is called Uttarakashi, that means Northern Kashi. And it is a beautiful temple where you can go and sit and meditate quietly, especially if you are there during the non pilgrim season, although it gets cold, it is very close to Gangotri. And there is nothing, no attractions there except the sadhus and the ashamas, where you can go from one ashram to another. There are any number of Anyakshetras. So, if you are a sadhu and register yourself there, you can get two times free food in any one of these ashramas. So, Babaji took me there and uh, we lived in two kutirs. And he instructed me to be there for uh, till April. Uh, he was going away to Gomuk. He said he will come back and then we will travel together. So, till then I was supposed to remain in Uttarkashi. Longest period I was remaining without seeing Babaji, six months. So, I was left to fend for myself, to go and collect food from the Anachetra, come back. If it is not too good, heat it a bit and put salt and eat it. And I had wonderful opportunities to meditate, go from place to place. I met lovely sadhus. One day, <coughs> while I was sitting in outside the courtyard, inside the courtyard of the Kashi Vishwanath temple and meditating with closed eyes, I was suddenly uh, awakened by, I felt that somebody was looking at me. 
So when I opened my eyes, I saw a man who looked completely mad. He, his eyes were red and bulging out. And in that cold, he was bare bodied. He was just wearing a small cloth and his hair was all dirty and ruffled. And his mouth was open with his tongue out. And I was really scared. I thought he was a completely mad man. Then he poked me with his finger. And then he said, Siddho, Siddho. And he also said, Bhalo, Bhalo. Hoi gyalo, hoi gyalo. So this was a language which at that time I couldn't understand much. And then he screamed loudly, shrill voice and ran away. So I was stunned. I didn't know what was happening. Now there was a senior monk of the Ramakrishna mission, a Bengali monk also. He was also a Bengali. He was sitting next to me regularly and meditating. So I approached him because he was witness to this. So the next day I approached him and I asked him, Swamiji Maharaj, what was this man saying? I think he's completely mad. He said, no, no, I don't think he's totally mad. He said, Thakur has said, Thakur in the Ramakrishna mission and in Bengal, when they say Thakur, normally they refer in the Ramakrishna mission circles, especially to Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. So he says that Thakur has said that there are sometimes rarely, greatly realized souls, highly spiritual, who are called Paramahamsas who look like madmen. They, 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 you think that they are mad, but they are really not mad. They put up the... Also, they are in such deep ecstasy that they are as if they are drunk most of the time. Drunk not with liquor, but with ecstasy. Ananda that comes from the soul. So these are... He said, I think he was a Paramahamsa. I said, but what was he saying? He said, yeah, I heard very clearly. He was saying, Siddho, Siddho, Bhalo, Bhalo, Hoi Gyalo. He said that Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa also used to refer to some people like this. He would also poke some spiritual practitioners and say, Siddho. Because in Siddha means a perfected being, but in Bengali, Siddho means boiled. So when you want to boil a potato, you said make it siddha. That means boil the potato. That means it is ready. The vegetable is boiled and ready. And in Bengali, bhalo bhalo means very good, very good. Well boiled, ready. And hoe gallo means it is done. It is done. So the Swamiji told me that you are blessed. I think he says that you have you are ready and you have already been. So I told him. From my side, I don't think I have done anything to merit that description. But Babaji's blessing is there, so perhaps it is so. Anyway, that was one of the experiences in Uttarkashi. I used to wander all around, go to these different sadhus. There is also the Tapovan Kutir there, where Tapovan Maharaj, who was the guru of uh, Swami Chinmayananda, used to live. In fact, the Chinmaya mission today is uh, built just behind the kutir. It includes the kutir also. And from that kutir, there is a view of the Ganga. There used to be. Recently, I found that that view has gone because some ashrams have come up on the side. I used to go and sit quietly. Tapon Maharaj was not there. Once or twice, I ran across Swami Chinmayananda when he came there because he used to travel and come and spend some time. So I used to go and see all these sadhus living there. There were Dandi Swamis. Dandi Swamis are Swamis, who, sannyasins who are initiated by the Shankaramats. So they are in the Shankaramat, if you have to take sannyas, you have to be a Brahmin. So these are, when you see a Dandi Swami with a stick, with something tied on it, that means they are Brahmana sannyasins. They are initiated from the Shankaramathas. So I saw many of them there, they greet you saying Narayana. Always, Om Namo Narayana. Some of them were very learned. Some of them were very old. 
and they were living under these difficult circumstances and being very happy. You could see the happiness on their faces when they went to get food from the Anachetras. So I enjoyed this whole thing. Additionally, Babaji had instructed me to learn Sanskrit. So I, he had introduced me to one Krishnananda Sharma who was a great Pandit, Sanskrit Pandit, living in Uttarkashi. Many people used to come to him. So the first day I went to him and uh, he asked me, what is your name? I said, Madhukarnath. Mm, Babaji told me that you are coming. Okay. So you want to learn? I said, yes. So he said, first you have to learn chanting. <coughs> If you don't learn chanting, then you cannot go forward. We usually don't start with grammar, we start with the chanting of the Upanishads and the Vedas. So I said, all right, I am ready to learn anything. <clears throat> okay, have you been to a Patshala before? I said, no, I have not been to any Patshala. <clears throat> then he said, okay, we should start with the Taitriya part first. Chant the Taitriya part huh? and then we will proceed. I said, all right. I had never learned Sanskrit before, so I had a problem wondering how I was going to chant. But you must remember that the Malayalam language in Kerala, from where I come, has about 40% Sanskrit words. So I have, And I had by then read the Gita because of Babaji and so on. So started on the Taitriya. So he started the Shanti part. Channo Mitra Shamvaruna Channo Bhavatvariyama. So, and he said, I repeated behind him. After two, three verses, he stopped. And he said, Are you lying to me or have you been to a Padshala before? I said, No, Panditji, I have not been to any Padshala. Hmm. He said, Maybe Babaji's blessings. Then he said, What kind of people Babaji sends to me? I am surprised. I said, stay. So I learnt, he uh, learned Sanskrit with him for only six months when I was in Uttarkashi. That's the only grounding. But according to Sharma ji, Pandit ji, I was advancing very fast. So he attributed it to a past life. He said, otherwise it is impossible. So I said, whatever it is, but I am a sincere student, I am ready to study. So I studied. And the other significant thing was that I learned how to chant the 15th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita by heart. Now how this is possible that in such a short while you can learn. I learned it in three weeks because in the Himalayan ashramas, especially in Uttarkashi, Rishikesh and other places, when you sit to eat food, all the Swamis and Brahmacharis before eating have to chant the 15th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, which is called Purushottama Yoga. Only after chanting you are allowed to eat. So the incentive was very strong. I was worried that if I don't chant, I may not be allowed to eat. Especially for Brahmacharis and Sannyasins living in Uttarkashi, who get food by going to the Annachetras. Occasionally, someone comes and has a bhandar. Bhandar means a feast. And all these brahmacharis and swamis are all invited to come and have. Now, when you go there, everybody is chanting the 15th chapter by heart and you left out, if you don't know. So, for a few days, I pretended to chant. I moved my lips. Then I decided it is better to learn by heart. So, within three weeks, I was chanting the 15th chapter beautifully. It's a wonderful chapter. Um, probably it is used before eating because it refers to the digestive acids and the movement of the digestive system and so on. But basically it's Purushottama Yoga means 15th chapter, Panchadashodhyaya means uh, the Purushottama Yoga means the teaching on that supreme being who is beyond everything in which Krishna explains how even though you see him as Krishna, he is in essence beyond all the world and yet being part of the whole world. This is Purushottama Yoga. 
and it starts with a very beautiful statement it talks about an upside down people tree because it starts with urdhva moolam mathashakam ashvatham prahuravyayam chandamsi yasya parunani yastam vedas vedavi that means krishna says in the 15th chapter there is an upside down people tree whose roots are up above and whose branches are down below and whose leaves are the vedas and he who understands this understands the whole truth now upside down people normally all trees are with the roots down and the branches up here is a tree with its roots above and the branches down below this is an imagery which is created to show that the world that we see and the human beings that we see and the living things that we see are all rooted on the higher truth which is beyond it's not a direction up and down physical it means that which is beyond the essence is there and from there these whole branches have come up and if you cannot directly understand the essence you have to understand the branches and the leaves before you begin to realize that the essence is the root actually is higher up it's spiritual and not physical this is the meaning of urdho moolam mathashak apart from the fact that it represents the yogic anatomy where the brain is the sahasrara chakra which is the root and this entire system of the body are the branches and the leaves controlled from this center which is known to science anyway so in meditation we go to this center slowly and come to the essence of consciousness